Broadcast is now starting. All attendees are. Hello, everyone. Today is Thursday, March 8, 2018. And this is the week in charts. Obviously, I want to thank all you guys and girls for attending. I appreciate you taking time out of your busy schedule. So, thanks. So, what are we going to talk about? Well, obviously, current market conditions, your questions on trading, your favorite stock picks. If you don't mind, Two things. One, hold off on your stock picks until we get to the live charts and open it up. We should have plenty of time for that. I do have a lot to cover, but we should have plenty of time to get to all your questions, or at least most of them, on favorite stock picks. And then your questions on trading. Now, if you don't mind, just to keep me on topic so my ADD doesn't kick in, let's try to keep the questions relating related to uh, the topic at hand. But once we get uh, towards the end of the presentation, if you want to ask about other things, that's fine with me. And worst case scenario, it'll give me fodder for a future show. So what do we talk about as far as the main focus? Well, this week, and this comes from a column I wrote earlier this week or published earlier this week, and I'll explain a little bit more about that in a second. Are you making these 10 psychological trading mistakes? And then I want to do a little recap on Dave Light and a bear market update. The Dave Light concept is very simple, and it always amazes me that these simple concepts can work so well. I, earlier in my career, I worked a lot with these simple concepts, went off to chase rainbows, and then many years later came back to these simple concepts. And I'm still rediscovering these things. And that's part of the genesis of why I trademarked Trading Simplified, which you'll notice is on my website. I guess before we do all that, there's a disclaimer screen. Obviously, you can't read it that quick. Nobody reads them anyway. But go to my website if you want to actually read it. The bottom line is you could lose money trading. And all predictions are about the future. And a lot of stuff can happen between now. And then Greg Morris said that. Happy birthday, Greg Morris. So the question is, are you making these 10 psychological mistakes in your trading? Recently, as many of you know, I've been working on a project with Metastock, which is now in the hands of the beta testers. We're pretty happy with how it came out. The beta test is going to work on it for a little while. And then a couple of months, it's going to come out in the new version of Metastock, and I'll have a link in a few minutes on that when we get to the, the indicators, or at least the daylight indicator. Anyway, long story endless, I know too late. I was looking through the layman's guide to trading stocks, and I found a psychological checklist of 10 things to ask yourself, and what I've done earlier this week is I expanded upon that in a column, and I got to thinking this would be good information to share in a chart show, so maybe I could flesh out a few of the concepts and maybe bounce some things off of you guys and girls in the process. So the first one is, are market conditions favorable for your methodology at the moment? And one thing that I discussed in the layman's guy to trading stocks was to take the Rip Van Winkle sleep test. Pretend that you looked at the prices of a stock in a newspaper, if they still exist. I don't know if they still exist. And then you decided to take a very long nap, and then you woke up, and then you looked at the prices again without all the zigs and zags in between. And you're like, hey, you know what? it looks like prices really didn't go anywhere. So that's one thing that you need to pay attention to. Now, whenever I talk about this net-net price movement and how a market's not trending, I always say come to the weekend charts, which you're here now, and watch what stocks people ask about. And notice that many of them haven't trended for days, weeks, and even months. In other words, they're relatively unchanged when you apply the net-net price change to them, or the Rip Van Winkle sleep test. And I think, and I'm going to flesh this out in a few minutes, but I think that that has something to do with a psychological flaw 
And its flaw is more prevalent in more successful people. I don't want to give that away just yet. But we'll get there. The next thing is, are you following sound money management? Now, as I often say, we have a saying in the South, the sun's the sun is a shine on the same dog's ass every day. And by that I mean that in some cases, or in all cases, I guess, your methodology will perform better at some times than at others. And I know I've told the story ad nauseum, but I'll tell it again. I was speaking in Dallas a while back, and Peter Monthy was living back there, living there back then, and he invited me to speak to a, a conference at a conference. And I said that momentum trading, my methodology, which is momentum trading, is very streaky. And after the speech, he said, well, you know, you're making it sound kind of elusive by calling it streaky. And I thought about it long and hard. I was like, well, it is. And what happens is you'll print money for a while. And then you go back to all too quickly, by the way, to just grinding it out day after day after day, waiting for that next print money phase. Now, I've, I've given a complete presentation just on this in and of itself, but a lot of times, many people give up in the bad times right before the good times come along. And I think I have a little bit in, in a further slide or a slide coming up on that. As I often say, money management will cure a multitude of sins. There are two problems that we face as traders, a good problem and a bad problem. Well, the bad problem, obviously, is when you have losing trades and the sun is, isn't shining on your methodology. Well, as I say, money management will cure a multitude of sins. Money management will keep you, your account relatively undamaged or at least mitigate the losses in less than ideal conditions. That's the bad problem in how money management helps it. But the the good problem to have is when you're printing money. Well, if you have a money management plan in place, it's going to it's going to help you from over leveraging during great times because you can press a little, that's okay. But you don't want to over leverage because that brings a whole new set of problems. And a lot of times when you start doing really well, your ego begins to take over. And that's something we're going to get to in just a few minutes. But the bottom line is, if you're following sound money management, that means that you're actually scaling out of a winning position, which could be tough at times because you, you take profits, partial profits, and then you watch day after day after day if it keeps going higher. Well, you forget that you're still in half and you're still doing pretty darn good. And you also forget the amount of times that you didn't take partial profits and the stock came right back in and you ended up at a loss. But if you're following solid money management, it's going to cure a multitude of sins. As I often say, people will email me and say, Dave, I'm down 50% in this stock. And I'm like, okay, well, let's take a look at that. And it's like, where would you stop? Well, it was 30 points higher, but I didn't honor it. Well, if you honored your stop, you would not be having this psychological problem that you're having now. Now, you're going to see a lot of these are interrelated. But along the lines of good times, bad times, and just in different times, you have to ask yourself, have you lived through a variety of conditions? So... If you've only been in a bull market for a few years like we have, you don't know what it's like to be in a bear market. And as human beings, it's impossible not to get excited when things are going well and bummed out when things aren't. But once you go through a few of these cycles, it's going to really help to temper your emotions. So doing fantastic times, you'll say, well, this is great. But I'm not going to over leverage or let my ego take over because I know that sometimes bad times will follow. And during sideways periods, you'll have said, well, I've seen this before. I can't hit the side of the board, long or short. 
maybe now is the time for me to just sit on my hands. Or as one client says, go find something that is far more interesting to do. Now, again, these are interrelated, as you can see so far. Do you really know your methodology? And as I said a minute ago, it could be a little streaky if you're trading momentum. But let's say that you're in a really good bull market and that streak lasts a while. And you're thinking like, wow, this trading thing is so easy. I've had a lot of people come in doing really good periods in the trading service. And they follow along for a while and we print a little money for a while. And then they're like, hey, Dave, you know what? I got this. I'll see you later. It's like, okay. Well, just remember that it won't always be like this. So be careful and don't, um, don't let that ego rear its ugly head and do something stupid, as I often preach, like tell a boss the F off or quit a profitable business. And I've seen this happen quite often. Now, the reason I have a little bull with the brains is you got to be careful not to confuse a bull market with brains or brains with a bull market, as Humphrey Neal said many years ago. Now, what's interesting is you could also say any other one-sided market. It hasn't happened that often, or it's, it's less likely to happen, but there's been a couple of times since I've been a public figure in the trading world where I've had clients print money in bear markets. And I, I know one guy in particular, his first trade was a short, which I thought was pretty impressive. Like, who would get into the markets and then immediately start shorting? That's something that you want to kind of ease into after you get the long side down pat. But this guy became a bit of a perma bear. And I know of other situations where people were following more arcane things. And as I often say, everything works better with trends. So if you're doing something that's more arcane, let's say counting waves, and your wave count corresponds with the trend, well, guess what? You're going to print money, okay? But when the wave count no longer corresponds with the trend, and I'm thinking about the bear market we had a while back, 2007, the wave count stuff actually worked pretty damn good. And there wasn't a whole lot of questions about what wave we were in and all. But unfortunately, it's suggested we were going to keep going lower after a big retrace or after a retrace, and that's where people who really bought into this type of trading got hurt really bad. So don't confuse brains with a bull market and don't confuse brains with a bear market or don't confuse brains with a trending market for that matter might be a better way of putting it. So my best clients are those who have lived through a variety of conditions and stuck it out through good times and bad. And they realize when things are really good that it won't always be this way and when things are bad, Fortunately, they will improve. And then also there's a lot of times where you just sit on the hands, sit on your hands. And as I've said before, years ago when, when I was part of trading markets and they actually had marketing people, the marketing people would call and beg me to recommend some stocks. If I were recommend if I was recommending stocks and they were stinkers, they really didn't lose clients. But if I said sit on your hands, we would lose clients and the salespeople couldn't make money because they were commission only. And they would actually call me up and beg me to recommend stocks. And it's like, well, I can't do it. I'm sorry. But if I'm not taking any trades, why should I just throw some crap out there for these people to get hurt with? Now, I'm not saying that I'm the grand Pumbaa and all that. I just know that I've been through a lot, both good, bad, and indifferent. And I've experienced the ego and I've experienced the desperation and, and downright depression that comes along with trading and trading through a variety of conditions. And once you experience that through a variety of conditions, you're much better to Number one, recognize when you are in one of those conditions. And number two, keep your ego depre uh, depressed, keep your ego in check and not get too depressed. Keep your ego in check in good times and keep your keep from getting depressed in bad times. 
easy for me to say. Anyway, the point I'm making with this one also is that there is no Holy Grail, as I often preach. My wife's like, what are you going to talk about? The Holy Grail? I'm like, no, yes. <laughs> what are you going to talk about? Not the Holy Grail, huh? Uh, yeah. <laughs> but we're all guilty of searching for that Holy Grail. I think we all have to have a little bit of hope that we'll find something that's really incredible. But the reality is simple things can work. Unfortunately, they don't work amazingly well, but they work well enough and that's about as good as you can hope for when it comes to the markets so keep it simple follow along and realize everything works better with trends so and i know i'm kind of circling back on this but if you the simple little trend following techniques we're going to talk about today daylight's just one of them and i'm going to touch upon bow ties it's amazing how that can help to keep you on the right side of the market it's not going to help you get rich overnight, but over time, it's gonna help you to be right over time. Remember, we're not right every time, but, and I hate to use the word hope, but hopefully longer term, we're gonna be right over time. Now, the question you have to ask yourself, especially if you're going through some psychological issues or emotional issues is, are you straying from your methodology if you're a day trader that's fine day trade now i don't i'm not a big fan of day trading and I'm, i used to make jokes and call them crazy ass day traders and then i got a lot of nasty emails from crazy ass day traders but i don't think you're crazy for day trading i think you need to recognize that you're making a lot of decisions and it's a very tough way to trade and we're just simply not wired to make all of the decisions now before i digress too far the point I'm making today here is that if you are a day trader, then don't make little tiny, tiny profits and then decide you're going to hold positions overnight for days and then get wiped out on a couple of positions. And I have a couple of positions, I, sh I should say, wipe out all of those gains. Now, if you're trading the swing to intermediate term trading like me, you should not be day trading, okay? You should not be making numerous trades daily. You should not be buying overbought markets. I'm sorry, you, know, you should not be selling overbought markets or shorting markets that are, are buying oversold markets. Let me rewind, rewind that. You shouldn't be picking tops and picking bottoms. That's another way of saying that. So don't short because the market is overbought trying to outsmart the market, fighting the trend, in other words, and don't buy because it's oversold, in other words, fighting the trend, trying to outsmart the market. Now, as I often preach, I fixed a few clients by dissecting their portfolios, by removing out day trades, and in some cases, breakouts, other than IPOs, because as you guys know, I do trade some breakout type of strategies in IPOs, but as a general statement, I'm not a big fan of breakout trading because breakouts more often than not fail. Now, there's nothing wrong if you want to be a breakout trader with being a breakout trader, provided, of course, you know. I know some very smart people who are breakout traders, and they tell me that, yeah, their win rate is horrible and that they lose and lose and lose and lose and lose until they finally get it. Well, I mean, that's momentum trading in general, but that's especially true with breakout trading. And that's because nowadays everybody has a computer in their desk and they know when a breakout happens. And a lot of people, a lot of professionals go in and fade those breakouts. So if you are a trend trader, then you're not, you shouldn't be trading reversals or trades outside the core methodology or day trades. And when I take these trades out of their portfolios, their portfolios are often profitable. They'll have like a negative portfolio over a period of time. We strip out the day trades or the breakouts or the shits and giggles trades or whatever they may be that are outside of the methodology. And they often find out that they would have been profitable just following the trend. And then, of course, the the aha epiphany that I often get is I know, I know. Now, keep in mind in this business, 
there are a lot of people that make inflated claims and there's a lot of people that claim that they really know what they're doing and that they're they're this great amazing trader and i've got a few stories here but i know like one case in particular where someone's like well the market broke out so i bought it and it just so happened to follow through now he tells me three days later that he bought it well and then the market or markets or stocks break out and come right back in. And I was like, oh, did you trade that breakout? Oh, no, I, I faded that breakout. I, I sold those stocks. So he's always on the right side of the market every single day. And nobody's that good. If, if he were, he would own the world. So on that, I do my bullshit detected. I have, well, that's a, that was a bad Yoda. Let me start over. Bullshit detected. I have, doing a little Yoda imitation. So don't let don't let someone else tell you they've got all the answers. And if they do, just say fine. Let's sit down together and let's figure it out. Let's let's trade together, and uh, and just see see how they in, their, in Louisiana we have a saying called crawfish. Crawfish swim backwards and walk backwards. So crawfish means to back you know back out or whatever. So call them on it, and don't let the market itself suck you into move its movements unnecessary sometimes you just have to let it go sometimes the market will break out and take off without you and might not let you in for a long time so don't have that fear of missing out just follow your methodology which sometimes i know can be hard just waiting for that right setup to happen and ignore the claims of others inflated ego claims of others as I often say, the main secret to trading is there is no secret. If there were, there would be no more markets. And this is why I have decided over the years, or I've learned over the years, just to avoid getting too complex in my analysis. And what very few indicators I use, which is only really moving averages, I use uh, historical volatility, but that's not necessarily an indicator. That just shows me how volatile stock is. So I know that my stop needs to be really wide or I know if I'm going after something very dangerous. But really, the only thing I really use other than blank charts is a moving average. And we'll talk talk about that in one second. But if there is a secret to trading, every now and then I'll come up and say, well, there's no secret to trading, but there is this secret. And this secret, one secret or one of the one secrets is that you just want to do one thing, okay? If you try to do everything, then I can all but guarantee you're going to fail. You're not going to be able to be a breakout trader and then have that market follow through on the breakouts and then decide, well, maybe I'll be a reversal trader. And then, of course, the market will follow through on the breakout. So be careful in getting sucked into current market conditions, but follow your system longer term. Okay. Ooh, lots of uh, comments and questions. Keep them coming. Uh, I should have been paying attention because now they're out of context. <laughs> oh, good times, bad times. Yeah, that's uh, Led Zeppelin. Right, right. Is that in through the outdoor? Good times, bad times by Zeppelin. You know, I'm sh I have my share quoting Zeppelin. Yeah, I think we all have. Okay, somebody says no sound. I think we still have sound. Uh, what happens is a squirrel may have gotten his nuts caught somewhere between me and you in the wires. And uh, he was moving his nuts and got them caught, I guess. But what happens is, um, the good news is the recordings are very robust. And I will put it up on YouTube when I'm done here. Now, have you been trying to outsport the market? You can see how all these sort of dovetail together. And in general, what I'm saying is, are you you trying to get in maybe early before trigger? And that's called front running. Now, front running, once you get a little bit more advanced, you can front run, but just make sure you're in a market that's that lends itself to front running. Front running was a great technique in the late 90s because everything went up anyway. And once everything officially triggered, it seemed like the slippage went out of control and, and it just was crazy. 
so you get in a little bit early. Now, I'm hesitant to tell you that because 99 out of 100 times, you really don't want to be front running a trade. It's going to get you into a lot of trouble. But once you get in, get a little experience and once conditions are fantastic, then, yeah, you can front run a little bit. But I would strongly urge you not to until you, A, get a lot of experience and, B, until conditions are really fantastic. Now, the other thing people do is they exit at the first minor signs of adversity. They got all their plan laid out. They have all their plan laid out, I guess I should say. Stock triggers. They're like, oh, follow my plan. And then 10 minutes later, the stock comes in just a little bit. And they say, you know what? Screw this. The market's going up. My stock's going down. I'm just going to get out. And then, of course, by the end of the day or maybe the end of the next day or the day after, the stock takes off without them. The other problem that I see quite often is people take little tiny profits. What's the old commodity adage? They eat like a eat like a bird and poo like an elephant, you know, <laughs> defecate like an elephant. Take little tiny gains and then big huge losses. But there's an old Wall Street adage that says you can't go broke taking a profit. Well, that's BS because if you don't make enough money longer term and don't make some big money longer term, you will never pay for your losses. So that's another problem that I see. So in other words, are you just not following your plan? And another way of summing that up is saying, okay, are you micromanaging your trades and not following the plan? Well, the next question is, do you even have a plan? As I've said quite a bit, a few years back, I decided that I was going to think about, I was thinking about why do people not plan their trades? And I was like, you know, let me just go for a little walk here, get some fresh air. And about halfway through my walk, I got to thinking, oh, I know why people don't plan their trades. And that reason is the moment you plan your trade, you have accepted a negative or potentially a negative outcome that you could be wrong because that plan involves a stop. And if you have a stop on your trade, it means that you could be wrong. Now, we can go much deeper into this, and I do have a few more things I want to say about it, but the bottom line is a stop sort of removes the hope from the trade. And as humans, we're not wired to be hopeless. I mean, we're pretty motivated individuals as a race in general and we have a lot of we have a lot of hope to us and otherwise if there wasn't any hope why bother but there really isn't much place for hope in the markets you know the old hope in one hand and the other thing comes to mind speaking of mind mind sculpting is something that i think it's ian robertson and i think it's called mind sculptures his book it's a worthy read I haven't put it on my to read um, books to read page just yet, which I'll give you a link to in a minute. But he talks a lot about mind sculpting, and that's sort of a, a mental rehearsal. And this is something I went into a lot of detail in the trading full circle, the psychology part, which we'll I'll talk about in one second. But basically, you're mentally rehearsing what could happen, and you probably should do this on the good and the bad because the good, sometimes it's hard to follow that plan because what you do is, again, you micromanage, taking those small profits, or you just let everything ride as opposed to following the money management, which circles us back to money management will cure a multitude of sins. Lately, I've been reading Annie Duke's book, and I'm nearly done, and it's a very worthy read, and I just added it to my to reading page, which I'll give you a link to in just one second. And she said, coming to peace with a bad outcome in advance will feel better than refusing to acknowledge it, facing it only after it has happened. Well, that's the mind sculpture thing that I got into in a lot of detail, mentally rehearsing in the trading full circle psychology section or the micro course, however you want to look at that. 
So it helps if you know that there could be a bad outcome and you're willing to accept that. And that's a huge part of following that plan. Planning a trade is pretty damn easy. There's not a whole lot of psychology involved with planning a trade as long as you recognize, as they say in market wizards, wizards intuition versus intuition. Now, speaking of intuition versus into wishing, are you trading the best and leaving the rest? I've, as I've said over and over, I've had people ask me about stocks that look like electrocardiograms all of the time, just bouncing all over the place. And again, that net net problem rears its ugly head. If you're a trend trader and the market's going sideways for weeks or months or it's bouncing back and forth, and if you're not seeing a whole lot of setups, then there's probably nothing to do. So you wait. Now, one question that I used to ask over and over is, why do the same people who strive for perfection in life settle for such mediocrity in markets? And I'm fortunate in that I get to converse with a lot of successful people from all walks of lives. Dog trainers, doctors, lawyers, automatic transmission mechanics. It's the gamut. Um, people in the... Uh, in the what's what was what how do you explain that um for the enthusiasts of the cannabis you know it's like i've got a wide gamut but very successful people in what they've done but a lot of the same people will sell for mediocrity in the market so i often ask that question and this is straight from trading full circle psychology section on the micro course in psychology Anyway, I got an email after one of these weekend charts. I think it can answer the question about why highly trained and skilled professionals can't seem to get the chart reading slash trading thing. I'm a physician who specializes in psychiatry. Doctors, lawyers, and automatic transmission mechanics are trained to take whatever train wreck comes along and fix it. We are expected to do something immediately, regardless of the conditions and desperate despite the possible negative desperate despite the possible negative outcome of our action so we have no choice they can't sit around and wait as a physician if you dwell too much on the potential negative outcomes you will become a deer in the headlights and not be able to function so we tend to minimize minimize the negative aspects of the situation waiting for the perfect pitch is not what we are trained to do and that's what i used to say quite often is if you are a lawyer you better go defend some bad guys or defend some good guys <laughs> i had a lawyer friend i told him once it's like uh well i hope i hope you get to defend some good guys this week he says god i don't make any money off the good guys send me some bad guys i was like oh okay well let's not go there anyway this doctor went on to say we have no trading to prepare us for sitting on our hands and waiting. It is simply not part of our mindset. And that's from Dr. J. So, again, if you're a lawyer, you can't sit around and wait for the perfect client. Otherwise, you'll have to shut down shop. If you fix, if you fix automatic transmissions, you can't sit around and wait for the ones that are going to be easy fixes. You have to fix the next one that comes along. Otherwise, you won't be a business very long. So you get it. We have to, as professionals, we're trained to take whatever train wreck comes along. But in trading, as I often preach, the real world and the trading world are two different things. Now, this is a big one. Are you dealing with any major, not so major life events? So I wrote this several years ago. Jeez, I think it was more than several years ago, five years, no, eight, nine, oh shit, has it been 10 years? I'll have to see when uh, the layman's guy to trading stocks was published. I know it was shortly after the bear market. Crikey, it's been 10 years. Getting old. 
Anyway, this one really hit home. And the reason it hit home was because I might qualify here as dealing with some major life events. This is a picture I took of what we call my dad's Christmas tree. A couple of months ago, he was diagnosed with acute leukemia, and he had a hard but very short battle with the leukemia. And then they even added two or three more pumps to this thing on both sides, and it reached the point where it just there was no need to get another picture of it. It was it was rough enough. But what happened was he had AFib, and they brought him to the hospital for AFib. The reason he had the AFib was he was stressed out by my mom, who possibly had something really bad going on with her. And they nearly both got diagnosed with cancer on the same day. My mom has late stage lymphoma, and I've been, I set up a separate office over at my sister's house, which is three hours away. And I spent a couple of weeks over there, and I spent a week or so here and going back and forth. So it's, obviously, there's a lot going on in my personal life. And then to top all that, we've been working a downsize for quite a while, and that ball has been rolling to a point where there's no looking back. So in spite of all that's going on, we're forging ahead with this downsizing. And I haven't moved in 20-something years, so this is pretty stressful for me. And this is where I am now on six acres. And if you look to the left, you can't really see it because the trees, which were little saplings, we this was like a little tiny tree. I remember my wife saying, can you do something to make that tree grow? <laughs> it's like, yeah, well, it's growing now. Anyway, this is where I am literally right now as I'm speaking over here in this little guest house or mother-in-law suite, whatever you want to call it. And this is the main house and it's a garage over here, barn back there, gazebo, pond. Anyway, we're going to move from that to something much, much, much smaller. My youngest is going to college in a couple of months here. So I got a lot going on. So I certainly qualify as having a lot going on in my personal life. So, I have to make sure that I practice what I preach. So all of this is really forcing me to take a long and hard look at each and every trade. And this is the question that I've been asking myself lately. Am I taking this trade to try to fix something in my personal life, either ego-wise or money-wise, okay? Or is this a fantastic opportunity that must be taken. I'm a big fan of Tim, Tim Ferriss. I'm just kind of thinking about this on the fly. And I think it was in Tools of the Titans and maybe even his newest book, which I've been reading, Tribe of Mentors, which I'd recommend you read both. And I'll give you a link to that, uh, my recommended reading in just one second. And if you want to support um, DaveLandry.com, the free content, just click on the links because I'll get like a little crumb from Amazon. It's better than poking the eye. Uh, anyway, Throughout the books, they often say, like, if, if someone presents you an, an opportunity and you're not like, F, yeah, and they spell it out, then pass. And so that's kind of where I am with the trades. I need to be pretty much F, yeah, now before I take a trade, especially in light of what's going on in my personal life. Now, am I being philosophical and trying to turn a negative into a possible? Maybe. Am I interviewing myself? Sounds like it. But... <laughs> I think that that's something that you might want, regardless of whether you're having good times or bad times, it's something that you might want to ask yourself on each and every trade, okay? Am I taking this trade for ego purposes? Am I taking this trade to make money? Is this really an F yeah opportunity, okay? Can I walk away and be okay? The can't stand it test that I often talk about. And if you think you have the mother of all opportunities, then go for it. I was, I think it was in Charlie Munger's book, which I have here. I need to get around. I, I start way too many books and never get around to finishing all of them. But uh, I definitely will finish Char Charlie Munger's book. I'm not a big fan of fundamentals, uh, so I don't want to go down that road. But as far as philosophies in general, I think there's a lot of wisdom in that book, and I'd recommend you read it. The Wit and Wisdom of Charlie Munger. And 
in it, one of the things he talks about is that pretend that you only had 100 trades you were allowed in your entire life, okay? So every trade you look at, would it be worth spending one of those one of those 100 on that, that particular trade? So I thought that was kind of an interesting thing. And I'll probably circle back to that at some point in time. Okay, if you follow the written plan but lose anyway, is it really a bad trade? No, no, and that's why that's where I would bring you back to uh, what I'm currently reading, Annie Duke's Thinking in Bets. And I would also encourage you to go ahead and watch the micro course on trading psychology, where Terrence O'Dean talked a lot about markets generating noisy information um they don't markets don't necessarily generate a lot of clean information so thinking in bets is your everything that you do in life and especially in trading is actually a bet not necessarily gambling but a bet because there's a probability of the outcome and as Eldine pointed out sometimes bad decisions can have good outcomes and sometimes good decisions can have bad outcomes and that's sort of the whole uh, basis of Annie Duke's book, Thinking in Bets, is separating the good outcomes and the bad outcomes from luck and from skill. And that's very hard to do. And we all tend to attribute, and I think this is getting back to Terrence O'Dean, but it's been written by many others too, but I'll give O'Dean credit. We tend to credit a good outcome with skill and a bad outcome with bad luck. And that's not always the case. And that's something that I'm working really hard to try to wrap my head around is how do you know whether you made a good decision, even though it was a bad outcome or a bad decision, even though it was a good, good outcome. And the best thing that I found over the years to do that is a post-mortem, an honest post-mortem. Every time you get done with the trade, go back in and look at it and say, okay, if I saw this trade today for the first time, would I take it? Now, early in your career, you're going to look back at a lot of trades and go, what the hell was I thinking? But then further down the road, you're going to say that less and less and less, and you'll find yourself picking the best and leaving the rest. But I think the secret to overcome that, what's called an outcome bias, so-called outcome bias, is through a very, very, very thorough post-mortem and a very, very, very honest post-mortem. So send me the trade. Let's take a look at it. And if you're trading, now provided, of course, you're trading my methodology. If, if you're not, if you're trading something else, let me know. Okay. Couple people say no sound. Should I talk louder? <laughs> so anyway, before I forget, basically you want to make sure that you ask yourself again: Am I taking this trade to fix something in my personal life, or is this a fantastic and f yeah opportunity that must be taken? Taking the trades that must be taken is one of those secrets. I always say there's no secret, and there's a secret when um, and I hate to say this because it sounds kind of crazy, but when I was in, in the hospital with my father, it's like I saw some incredible opportunities in the cryptocurrencies. And then I was going through that in my head. Am I trying to prove my ego by trading this Bitcoin bubble and, and Litecoin and all these other ones? Or are these just fantastic trades that I must take? And my answer was, these are fantastic trades regardless of what's going on in my personal life. So let's separate these out. Let's make these Bitcoin trades and cryptocurrency trades and follow a plan. And I was able to follow the plan thinking that I don't have time to micromanage myself. I'm not going to watch a screen. I'm just going to do what needs to be done. So that was one thing that happened. My equity trading hasn't been fantastic, but 
it made me feel pretty good seeing the opportunities in the cryptocurrencies and, and to a lesser extent, a couple of uh, opportunities in Forex that, okay, I still have it. I just have to make sure on every trade, especially in the equities, because they weren't going as well, to make sure that's an FEA trade and make sure I'm not trying to fix something in my own life. Well, one of the things in, in that I've discovered with the equities was that part of the problem there was we were coming into this correction. And when you're trading momentum, sometimes that happens. You just can't catch a trade to save your life, even though the market's still trending. Well, what's happening is, and this is a different, is a whole another conversation in and of itself, but what's happening in that situation is sometimes the momentum names begin to crack first. And the other stocks are still kind of keeping the mark, market up, the, the maybe more value names or whatever, but less momentum names. And then eventually when the market does crack, obviously you get taken out of everything. Now, one thing as I preach over and over again, you know what you're doing wrong. So ask yourself, what is it? This lady emailed me this a while back. She says, you know, I feel like Paul from the Bible who said, I want to do what is good, but I don't. I don't want to do what is wrong, but I do it anyway. And as I said repeatedly, and we talked about a little while ago, when I work with someone, I'm always like, geez, I'm going to figure out what this guy's doing wrong. And then once I start looking at the trades before long, it's like, I figure it out. Well, you take it all these day trades. You're not a day trader. Why are you take all these day trades? It's like, I know, I know, is the answer that I always get back. So provided you have some experience, of course, and trade it through, as I said, in number or whatever it was earlier, an uptrend, a downtrend, a sideways trend, and have stuck with one methodology throughout, then you probably know what you're doing wrong. Okay. So don't do it anyway. It's kind of the old doctor, doctor. I actually put that in the slides in the trading full circle. Psychology sex is like doctor, doctor. It hurts when I do this. Well, don't do that. Okay. Anyway, this, all of the, or a lot of the psychology stuff that's, that I talked about today, I go into a lot more detail in the psychology micro course. And the reason I released the micro course is that the master course is taking me forever to finish, especially with everything going on in my personal life. And I knew it was going to take a long time to get that out. And there's so much that I don't want to include in the master course. But the micro course will get you a long way to getting your ego in check, your emotions in check, and help you from a psychological point understand what's going wrong, why you should plan your trade, trade your plan, and all the other things I talked about earlier. Anyway. Now, say a limited time. It's I'm gonna I, I expected to start on the course much sooner than I did. I expected to start filming three months ago, and I thought I would even film before that, but I haven't started filming the uh, master course just yet. Now, with this stuff, if you do have, let's say you get this, when the master course comes out, you'll get a discount off the master course or whatever, and that's probably going to be a year from now based on the way everything's going right now. But that'll be okay. I, it'll it'll be it'll be right when the time comes. I'll have everything uh, down, and there's a lot of stuff. And each day it just gets bigger and bigger. I keep adding and adding to it. But anyway, check it out. Micro course in my store. Now, let's take a look at these questions real quick, and then we'll get um... <laughs> like the Elvis song. Temperature rising is the way to tell success is when your expectancy is rising. Okay. Take that. Damn squirrel nuts. Yeah, those squirrels. I get their nuts caught. Uh, recently, I've been talking about this. I did a presentation earlier this week, and then I also have one. Go watch the week of charts that I did in February. And I'm going to update that in just a few minutes. But Metastock program the indicators, as I said earlier. And if you go to getting started, you can get Metastock there. In a couple of months, you'll have these indicators. And then I'll let you know uh, what I have, what parameters, or what I found if you want to uh, add to them. And so what I did here was I actually made a tap, made a copy of one of them called it Daylight. And then I'm using a 50-day moving average. And I'll give you that code, too. And this just counts the days of daylight. So every day that the market 
low is greater than the moving average, it adds another tick, okay? It's not the magnitude. It's not how far. It's not the distance, okay? It's the number of days this way. But there are some really interesting things, and I'm going to just touch upon these real quick. So up top, you're going to have a positive count, and on the bottom, you have a negative count. So let me just go through this real quick, and then I want to get you up to speed as to where we are now. One observation is there will be Dave Light. It's, it was originally Daylight. One of you guys renamed it Dave Light, and I like that, so it's going to stick. Dave Light during major bull and bear markets. Okay. Therefore, all, all bull and bear markets will begin with Dave Light. Okay. Write that down. But Dave, does that mean that every time you have Dave Light, you're going to have a bear market or bull market? No. Unfortunately not. There are no holy grails, right? But it's a very useful little tool that can help keep you on the right side of the market. So notice the mid to late 90s trend. We had nearly all positive daylight. And if you squint your eyes, we had a little tiny bit of negative daylight here. Now, one thing I pointed out last week, or last time I did a presentation of this, is that when the market hits an extreme, now this is a weekly chart, FYI. When the market hits an extreme, you got to be careful because it's getting very overbought and due to correct. I do not, I do not, it would not sound like a green eggs and ham, huh? Don't necessarily rush out and short a market. In fact, don't short a market just because it's, it's at an extreme. But do follow proper money management. I'll show you a little bit of that in one second and how it's working out. But you can see a lot of green, uptrend, a lot of red, downtrend. Look at this. We had no positive daylight in the bear market that began in 2000 until the market turned and then went up in 2003 to 2007. And what's interesting, and again, this is a weekly chart. Look down here. See a little W? What's fascinating is we had no downside daylight during that entire bull run. So that's pretty darn cool, if I say so myself. During the bear market of 2007, we had... I'm sorry, we had no negative daylight here. During the... During... During the... Uh, during the bear market of 2007, 2008, 2009, as you can see, it was all red, all negative daylight. You had this one little kiss here, but the low of the price bar never got above the moving average. Now, in the trend that followed, which wasn't necessarily a route straight up, it was for a little while. You had a lot of positive daylight. You did have a little bit of negative daylight in there, but for the most part, it stayed green. You had this correction here. Now, it didn't turn into a bear market, but you did have a little bit of negative daylight. And then you had this pretty impressive run up until 2015. And if you go back and look at the records from 2015 to 2016, somewhere in here, I was early 2016, I should say. We were doing a lot of shorting, just like we're starting to put on a few shorts now. Okay. And then I think we stopped out of most of those at profits after getting the initial profit target. It was better than the poke in the eye. It was able, we were able to kind of keep our head above water, even though the market began to tank a little bit. And then, of course, we've had this last leg up here. Now, what's fascinating is, and I'll zoom this in in one second, on the weekly chart, so far, we haven't tagged that 50-week moving average. Oh, by the way, this is a 50-week simple moving average, just keeping it with a simple moving average. Okay. And then on a daily chart, it's going to be a 50-day simple. Now, there's been some imminent top fear-mongering, and I've talked about this. In fact, last summer, it looked pretty iffy. And even that bastard, Jon Snow, was talking about winter is coming. But not just yet. Now I'm adding a little question mark here, because we are in a bit of this distribution phase. I don't know what you want to call it. Looks like the market's in a bit of a retrace. We'll take a look at that when we get the live charts. But obviously I do have some concerns. So that's a slide left over from last summer. So where are we now? Well, if you take a look at the P's on a weekly basis, as I just said, you can see that we still have upside daylight. It came fairly close to tagging that 50-week moving average, but so far 
it has it happened. And if we zoom in on our daylight count, we could see that, as I said earlier, yes, we did have some of that negative daylight back in 2016, and we did begin the short back here. Now, one thing I want to throw out real quick, you don't necessarily want to sit around and wait for the weekly to turn. You want to honor your stops, okay? And as you're seeing setups on the daily charts, if you see some good-looking shorts, you might want to fire off a short or two, okay? But it always helps to keep the big picture in mind. So bigger picture, we're still doing pretty good. The only problem that I see, bigger picture, on the weekly at least, is that just from my quick little research I've done in the past few weeks on this, when you get about 100 weeks of upside daylight, usually you'll see some corrective action. So this is something that we need to pay attention to. And somebody asked me last week, which I thought was pretty smart, but I think it's a dangerous thing to do because then you begin to complicate things. They're like, what, what would happen if you uh, added the daylight together? And I haven't wrapped my head around that other than empirically looking at it like, okay, we had no downside daylight. So this extreme reading here is even more extreme because you can go all the way back to here with no downside daylight. I think if you made it a cumulative indicator, I think it'd begin, it, would, it would become complicated really fast. One of the problems with making a cumulative indicator in addition to complicating things is that it would not measure the magnitude on the downside. And the magnitude on the downside is a lot quicker once the trend begins to start than it is on the upside. In other words, markets spend a lot more time in bull trends than there. But as I said in the last presentation, that's a really poor argument for buy and hold. This is a longer term daily chart, as you can see. And then in more recent times, we've had a little negative daylight, but not much. But you can see as a general statement, even on a daily chart, the greens help keep you on the right side of the market. But one thing that's kind of interesting is when you get above 100 day, even on a daily chart, usually you'll see some correction or at the least the market will begin to trade sideways a little bit and you'll see some negative daylight. And you can see in more recent times, we hit 100 and then most of this, you had a lot of green in here too. So you kind of mentally add that up. Okay, don't make an indicator out of it. Don't complicate things. We kind of mentally add that up, and then you could even go as far back as, let's say, 2016 and say, well, this green, which is a little tiny red in here, you add all that up, then you got a lot in your mind's eye. Don't make an actual indicator. So it's no surprise that we're getting a little corrective action now because we were due. And again, notice at these peaks, you do tend to get a little corrective action afterwards. Uh, 50 seems to be an interesting number too, FYI. So you could see around 50 or so, you do get some corrective action. And then we, we're way past that now, up at 100. Up at 100, I should say. Okay, is the 50 magic or would the 40 or 20 also work? But the time frame changes. The 20 is quicker time frame. The 200 is slower, longer time. Yes. Yes, you answered your own question. The longer the moving average, the more lag you're going, to, you're going to have, okay? And I don't think I have the fractal charts in here that I used last time or recently. But patterns are fractal. So look at a bow tie, for instance, coming off of all-time highs in the overall market. And you'll see that you had a beautiful bow tie in the spiders before this market tank, okay? So you could use whatever indicator you want. I use the 50 because it's well watched and it's something I've played around with quite a bit. The reason I started using the 50 for the 50 week moving average is I've done plenty of presentations to the point where I had some people tell me, stop talking about it, <laughs> where I look at a weekly bow tie and show how the weekly bow tie show the bull markets and the bear markets. Well, I started looking at the slope of the 50 day week I'm sorry, the 50-week moving average or just a 50-period moving average and look at a weekly chart, right? And just a slope in and of itself would, would also do a pretty darn good job, maybe almost as good as the bow tie. So, yeah, uh, mess around with a variety of uh, moving averages. I use the concept of daylight with a five-day simple moving average, okay, to 
trade IPOs. And that's on my website somewhere. And if you look at the layman's guide to trading stocks, I use a 10 day simple with what I call daylight pullbacks, or we'll call them Dave light pullbacks. OK, uh, actually, I call it kiss my goodbye. And then there's also a little topping pattern that I use called the first kiss after daylight. When you have the market break below its five day moving average, when it comes, I'm sorry, 10 day moving average. When it comes back to kiss that moving average, you look for a shorting opportunity. So, yeah, experiment with a variety of time frames. <laughs> can I use the hundred off coupon in a psychology course? No. <laughs> well, you can, but let me raise the price and put a promo in. <laughs> no, that's the only thing on the website you can't use a hundred dollar off uh, coupon code on. Sorry about that. And if you need that coupon co code for uh, anything else, just email me. I'll give it to you. And you can get all three of my books for free using the coupon code, promo code. Okay, so where are we now in the SP 500? Well. We did have the bow tie down, and a textbook entry would have been right there, okay? And as bow ties begin to pull back, sometimes you trade them as a pullback, okay? So in this particular case, because it pulled back so much, you would consider you're raising that entry up. But in case like this, you wouldn't necessarily go right below this low. You would give it a little bit of wiggle room. So maybe below this low would have been your entry, okay? And now you can see these moving averages have begun to get sloppy, meaning they're all meaning they're all over the place. OK, and even now you've got. Well, at this juncture here, I think they all had almost crossed right back over. So that's where you need to say, well, this is a retrace rally, but I'm not a retrace rally player. I don't short these big picture retraces. So you might want to not take the you know, don't take the bow tie. However, I was asked, I wrote the article about daylight and first thrust for Proactive Trader, I'm sorry, Proactive Advisor magazine. And the editor asked me, would the thrust indicator had led to a whipsaw situation? And notice that we had a first thrust down the trigger on a textbook manner would have been right here. And the textbook, in a textbook basis, it dropped 149 points. Well, that's nothing to sneeze at in the S&P 500. If you catch a swing trade on the S&P 500, 149 points, you make darn sure that you're taking some partial profits and you get that stop to break even. So to answer this question, yes, it would have led to a whipsaw. Okay. However, one would think you would have taken some profits along the way before you got stopped out on the remainder. Now, by the way, I'm not a huge fan of trading indices, except maybe on occasional opening gap reverse or whatever, because indices do tend to be a little bit choppier than individual stocks. They tend to be a little bit more efficient. OK, but what I explained last time we did a week of charts and what I explained this gentleman is that, yes, you may have gotten stopped out of the trade as a trade and you may, as I just said, have made a little money on it. But a transitional pattern such as a first thrust or a bow tie stays in effect as a potential top, potential, potential top until and unless the new highs are taken out. So if you don't walk away with anything from today, just remember that the market's in a little trouble and a potential top remains in place until and unless this gets taken out. Now, I'm not going short crazy right now. I'll show you the portfolio in just one second. Because what did I say earlier? Okay, what's the market doing on a net net basis? What's the Rip Van Winkle sleep test? Well, we got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, about a month's worth of trading here where the market really hasn't done anything. And as a trend guy looking for big blue arrows in the chart, maybe we need to sit on our hands. Well, the database is speaking, and there really aren't that many stocks that are setting up. So you want to let the ebb and flow control your portfolio, proper money management, and listen to the database, okay? Right now, I can hardly find a setup, a decent setup to save my life. So I'm mostly sitting on my hands in equities and managing what I have in the portfolio. And you can see this is one leftover long that was put on back in December, okay? And it's still on. And then there's two shorts in the portfolio. Well, the shorts have not paid off yet. This one a little bit, but I think it's, it's retraced up since then. This is a snapshot from two days ago. I think this one might have gone flat or negative. 
I'll check it in a second. And then this one here, you can see, is in the, in the minus column. So I'm not in a big hurry to put on a whole bunch of new shorts right now, and I'm not seeing a whole lot of new shorts. So I'm listening to the database, and I'm just following along. So I guess if you measured it, we're more short than we were along, but that doesn't mean that I'm crazy bearish. Okay, Don't get crazy bearish or label yourself. Do pay attention to what's going on. And right now, there are a few signs that have me concerned. I hope I'm wrong. I felt this way a couple of years ago. We did some shorts. We did okay with the shorts. We didn't, we didn't get rich, but we did okay. And the reason we took those shorts was the market was getting questionable. We just follow along, follow along. We let the gurus do the top picking. And you know what they like to do? They like to predict early and often. Okay. How does how does Dave Light trade on pullbacks? Good. I mean, that's the actual and those those are patterns. Those Dave Light patterns are included in that. Um, if you do end up with Metastock, those are in there. Okay. And then the Dave Light, what you're doing, and you could you could use your own whatever moving average you like. You can use an exponential if you want. Uh, it tends to work. I think I like the way it kind of works with the with the simple because you're able to get a cleaner daylight or Dave Light. But yeah, the pattern is that you, this is similar to a Lindy Rasky's Holy Grail, except that I'm using daylight, which I think is pretty cool, and not a trend indicator, which might have a whole lot of lag. But I do have to give Linda some credit for this, obviously. But you can see that the lows are greater than the moving average, and then you look for a pullback to that moving average, okay? And all of this comes, by the way, the daylight started with uh, an article I wrote in 1995 called the 220 EMA Breakout System. So Google that if you get a chance. You should be able to get a free copy on the Internet. Stocks and commodities used to charge like $1.95 for it, but there's so many people out there have shared it that you could probably get it free. Okay. Let's hop out to the live charts and if you guys and girls want to start asking about individual stocks feel free to do so now we've kind of beat the dead horse on the s p 500 but you can see we're just kind of meandering in here and so far again it has that big picture retrace rally look to it okay now it's headed a little higher as of late and i'm glad and i hope it goes on to make new highs people get mad at me sometimes when i get bearish it's like look <laughs> i'm just the messenger all right and at the least, you can see we just haven't made a whole lot of forward progress in a while. And then obviously, like I said earlier, we got a little stretch to the upside. We did have a correction. And I hope, and I know, open one hand and the other and see which one gets filled first. But I hope we go on to make new highs, and I hope that I worried for absolutely nothing. Hope for the best, brace for the worst. That's something that might be worth writing down. NASDAQ looks a little bit better than the S&P 500. You can see it's had the mother of all retrace rallies. My problem is, as I've been saying, ad nauseum, I'm sick of hearing myself, is that with these V-shaped recoveries, by the time the market gets all the way back to its old highs, it's already overbought, and it's hard for a market to launch an overbought leg on top of an overbought leg. Now, psychologically, maybe if we get the new highs and stay there for a while, the market could walk off that overbought condition, maybe go sideways a little bit, and we won't have to worry as much. Let's take a look at the Russell 2000. So far, it still looks like a big picture top because it just looks like a retrace rally. Let's take a look at like a two-day chart or a three-day chart. A little bit more obvious in the longer-term charts that so far we're just in a retrace. We did come down, tag this resistance. I'm sorry, support. And we're not that far away from all-time highs, but obviously you still have to get there. Okay. Now, there's no need to go through all the sectors. Most of them look alike. A few of them are looking worse than the overall market, such as the energies. You can see just kind of pulled back a little bit in here. Didn't even have a decent retrace rally, so that's a little concerning. Some areas like the banks and financials in general look like the overall market retrace rally. So far in this new leg down in here. I, again, I'm not, I wouldn't wave count or anything. I'm just saying that we had a thrust down. A big picture retrace and we haven't made it back to new highs so i think that we're still in this down leg until proven otherwise but i'm letting a database tell me what to do by providing setups and 
we had quite a few shorts back here when the market just pulled back a little bit. But now that it's all over the place, I'm seeing fewer and fewer setups, which is telling me to sit on my hands. Okay. And again, insurance and financials in general, kind of they all look the same. Big picture retrace rally still look like they could be in trouble in here. Let's take a look at financials real quick. Now, I'm not going to be able to call everybody by name today because I had a, um, a bug in my software. So I, everybody, I don't know everybody's name. So I'm just going to say, uh, I don't know if the same guy's asking about 10 stocks or we got 20 people asking about one individually. So if I don't call you by name, it's because I don't see your name in there. Anyway, financial, same sort of pattern, big picture retrace. The only thing that's really pretty good about this market is some of these areas like software did break out. That V-shaped recovery problem uh, is in place here. Same thing goes for the semis, which haven't quite gotten to their brand new highs. The hardware also looks pretty good, trying to break out in here, hovering around new highs. So there's some technologies doing okay, which is no big shocker with the overall NASDAQ not too far from all-time highs. But I don't think there's enough breath just yet for a new leg higher. And so I'm just staying cautious. All right, Donna wants to know about TWLO. Well, Donna has found one of the few stocks that's really trending out there. Um, yeah, on a pullback, maybe put it on your uh, watch list, but obviously it has to pull back or do a little TKO type of move. It does have some bad memories way back here, but I wouldn't, I'll just wait and see what it looks like when it sets up. I'm kind of a stickler when it comes to these longer term issues with a chart. But yeah, Don, that's definitely trending. Um, start looking for a pullback there, maybe a TKO move. CLBS for a random person. Uh, this one's a little bit on the thin side. Uh, I hear you, though. Bigger picture bottom looks like it's in place, bottomed out forever. Super thin, somewhat dangerous. It needs a little bit more of a pullback, but it's a little wide and loose and crazy. And I do like this gap here. I think I have a pattern called reversal gap strategy. You look for a gap to new highs, and you look for that gap to be tested. Uh, maybe if it pull back just a little bit more, but not too much. Maybe pull back to five-ish or so. But, yeah, that can go on your watch list for sure. TGT, TGTX. Yeah, this one's uh, trending. It hadn't really taken out the prior high in here. Let's back the chart out a little bit. Uh, I would pass. You've got a lot of bad memories back here. I know it was a long time ago. But you can see it kind of trades all over the place. It has a longer-term electrocardiogram look to it. Yes, it can trend higher, but it's kind of all over the place. So I think I'd pass on that one. CTG. Yeah, this is really thin. And then uh, this move here is just kind of extreme. Too much, too fast. I mean, that's well, that's only 50%, but... It just looks like it's overextended. It would really have to correct hard. And it's also really, really thin. Some bad memories way back here. It's just a little too erratic. I think I'd pass on that. I know I'd pass on that. So I can't see your names because if I see your names, I know certain there's certain people in here who like to talk about very volatile, thin stocks. We can't beat you up. KMPH is going to be a negative one. That's going to be, um, it's a little thin to short. Oh, wait, I'm, I'm either the wrong one. Never mind. I'm thinking of something else. Um, yeah, another one of those bad memory stocks longer term. I mean, it's got a mountain. I mean, I guess it'd be a good problem to have. It doubled up, up here. But you got to realize there's a lot of people on the hook with this stock looking to bail out that probably hadn't sold out yet. Okay. Markets have long memories, and then it's kind of all over the place. It's just kind of too crazy. Leave that alone. CLBS? Yeah, we talked about that one. BSPM? Uh, you know, I don't like this huge wide range bar here. Then it shot up and it came in. Remember earlier I mentioned HV? HV is 137. That's just... Unless you're trading uranium or something, that's just really too crazy to go after. QQQs, one point away from all-time highs, 20-day greater than 50, SMA, five months versus SPX, which is 15 days and counting, and the opposite, 20 minus 
50 EMA. So let's put the bow ties on. Take a look at that. One thing I like to do with bow ties is I like to add in the 50-day moving average for reference and look for the uh, inflection point when the bow tie crosses it or if it crosses it, I should say. Let's make this like orange, keeping with the theme today. Okay. What's fascinating is the cues never did actually bow tie down, okay? And I think the same holds true for the NASDAQ. Somebody was calling a bow tie on Facebook on the NASDAQ, and I chimed in and said, well, technically it didn't bow tie down. And neither did the cues. So you could see that the what is this? The 20 EMA came really close to the 30, but never did get below. It just made like a little squeeze in. It seems like years ago I studied that. There's a squeeze pattern you can look for in moving averages. So, yeah, I hear you. You got upside daylight again. You're not too far away from the highs. Uh, bigger picture. Let's take a little like a two-day chart. Bigger picture, as you can see, you have that big V to contend with. Okay. But, yeah, on a relative strength basis, the NASDAQ has done much better than the S&P 500. And the Qs also have done better, too. ASND for Dennis. Uh, let's see. Yeah, that looks really good. Um, little on the thin side. I'm not crazy about buying a whole bunch of stocks right now. Uh, it's been trending. You know, my only concern is that this is a little counterintuitive, but my only concern is that it's been in such a good trend for so long that it could be the bigger they are, the harder they fall. Like if the market does begin to crack, this stock is already priced for perfection. And then the other darned if you do and darned if you don't is that if the market begins to rally, sometimes these stronger stocks become a source of funds. Okay. Now, you can't trade directly off all that, but it's in the back of your mind when you're going after something that's in a longer-term established trend when the market's beginning to get a little iffy, okay? Now, maybe if it had a little bit more knockout move, I'd consider it. But, yeah, put it on your momentum list, but just keep those caveats in mind. ENPH, ENPH. We're up towards new highs. That's a good thing. And uh, kind of bottoming out much longer term. No really, really bad, bad memories until, what, 10? So, yeah, maybe on a pullback it might be worth a shot. WBAI. Yeah, it looks pretty interesting. This must be a Chinese stock. Um Looks like it, it, it's gotten past a lot of bad memories, and then you do have some trading up until this prior resistance here. So I wouldn't worry as much about that, and it was 2014. Um, it looks okay. I guess the only thing that's kind of jumping out at me is kind of in a drifting mode here. Draw your lines through the bars, or around the bars, I should say. And you could see it sort of went straight up, and then it kind of drifted higher. It did shoot higher, but come right back in. I don't like this loss of momentum in here. Now, maybe once it pulls back, it, it might look a little different. But I definitely would wait for a serious correction there, a serious pullback before considering WHD. Uh, this looks kind of interesting. Let's put the five-day moving average like we talked about earlier in here and see if we have a... I forgot what I call this pattern, the, the five-day daylight IPO breakout system. Yeah, you would have gotten long. This would be your long right here. So that would be a buy right there. Now, what did I say earlier about IPOs? I'm not a big fan of breakouts, but a breakout type of pattern can actually work in an IPO. So, yeah, this would be a long. It's all in gas services. Not really crazy about being long that sector right now. Not really crazy about being long any sector right now. But, yeah, if you had to do something, you could certainly do something worse, okay? So wait for it to close at a new closing high and then get long. That would look kind of interesting, yes. See, I don't hate everything. Twitter on a pullback? I'm not a huge fan of these big, thick stocks. Let's see. Well, the problem with the pullback is you just broke out to new highs, and then you just this whole 
thrust higher was just one day, okay? And you're just barely getting above this thrust higher. So it would actually have to have the mother of all thrust higher again and then look to play a pullback for me to get excited about that. Plus, it's a big, thick stock, okay? Can get a little choppy. But, yeah, I mean, you can't argue with the fact that it's going higher. That's for sure. L, G, C, Y. Okay. Yeah, another oil and gas. Uh, a little thin. Not too thin. It's, it's thick enough to trade. Uh, nice little trend higher. Let's back the chart way out, see what we have. Yeah, it looks like the mother of all bottoms. A little bad memories over here. But, hey, if it goes up 100%, I'd be a happy camper. So, yeah, I like this one a lot. Uh, let's zoom in a little bit. But wait for a setup. Nice persistent up move. Also, what did I say earlier? Okay, draw your lines and the charts. It's accelerating, right? Okay, so trend line here and then, bam, higher. Okay, so that looks pretty good. Yeah, high five, but on a pullback. So I don't know who typed that in because I can't see your name, but whoever did, good job. So you have Q a while. Okay, you've been in Q? Cool. Yeah, uh, let's check the uh, a little thin, but IPOs sometimes a little thin. That comes with the territory. Let's put that five-day moving average in there and see what your buy would have been on that. Buy at B would have been, let's see, one, two, three, four, five. Would have got you long right there. Yeah, the, the moving average pattern would have triggered right here too. And you could see uh, if you had a nice wide stop, you could have stuck with it. But psych psych psychologically, he tried to say, it would have been pretty hard to sit in this stock for about a month waiting for it to take off. S-F-L-Y. Shutterfly. Yeah, this is one that's really defied gravity. Um, my concern here looks like from last week was I don't like stocks that just have this huge quantum leap higher. Okay, so let's just see what it did. Roughly round numbers. 40% in three or four days. I think it would pass. It's just gotten too crazy too fast. And then before that, it was all over the place. So this is where you could argue that even Big Dave's trading simplified momentum trading strategies wouldn't have gotten you into that one. I mean, I guess you could say, well, I'd pull back here or whatever. But sometimes you have to let them go. That'd be one I'd say, let go, Dennis. Q&ST. Q&ST. Um, shorter term. We got a net net problem here. Okay, where was it in February? Okay, where is it now? 1.8%. Well, you can say, well, it's, it's it's higher. Well, it's not much. I mean, it does that in one day. Okay, based on a volatility of 85. No, it would have to break out and accelerate higher for me to get excited. JMP. Yeah, this looks interesting. Um, a little bit on the thin side. I like the way it's breaking out. It trades or has traded fairly cleanly as of late. Does have some bad memories. Maybe on a pullback. A little concerned about the bad memories. Maybe on a pullback. We'll just have to wait and see on that one. ZFGN. That sounds familiar. Did we do that one? It looks like we did this one, I think. Um, it would have to break out the new highs and then put, well, let me take, let me back it out a little bit. Yeah, longer term, I don't like the action here. Uh, it's just, it's got these big gaps and all and bad memories. I just pass on that one. ILVA. One thing I'm seeing here, what did I talk about earlier? We talked about acceleration in price versus deceleration. Depends on how you want to draw your trend line or use linear regression if you want. If you want to get fancy with it. But you can see that it kind of was taken off and now it's losing momentum. So stay away from that. I mean, put it in your momentum list, but you're not going to run out and trade it unless it accelerates higher and pulls back. ARWR. Sounds like a, a stock of power with like, with like R -R -R. Or uh, what's his name? Astro? Oh, longer term, it's kind of all over the place. That's the only thing that bothers me about that. Um, did kind of break out. It needs to pull back a little bit more, but if pull back a little bit more, it'd be back in the base. I'd probably pass 
Oh, I know I pass. I mean, definitely relative strength doing a lot better than everything else, but that's not a reason in and of itself to buy a stock. Now, this one looks interesting. ECYT. Um, yeah, I don't like this crazy action over here, okay? And the reason I initially said it looked interesting is because it was doing what? Accelerating higher. So on a pullback, that'd be kind of interesting, but a little wild and crazy. Unfortunately, longer term, it's kind of all over the place, so I'd leave it alone. SNSS. Uh, don't like this big, huge gap down way back here. Let's zoom in a little bit. And another one of those kind of losing momentum type of stocks, you can see. Well, it kind of took off here, but then it was just one bar and then kind of just drifted higher. I know it's a pretty big drift percentage-wise, but put it on your momentum list. I don't see anything happening there anytime soon, maybe on a pullback. But then you got this big gap to contend with. Anybody who held through that gap and still holding it is going to be looking to dump on top of you. QNST. Okay, we only have a few minutes left. Does anyone you want to get in real quick? I do have to keep the schedule today, so I won't be able to stay too late. Uh, did we talk about this one? Yeah, it's sideways at best at high levels. Okay. Tusk. Yeah, another one of these oil field stocks. Uh, kind of thin, so be careful there. But, yeah, I can't argue with that. It looks pretty impressive. Nice uh, thrust higher. A little wide in this longer term, but it finally got its act together. So maybe on a pullback. Okay. Any more? Going once. Going twice. Well, while we're at an impasse, I want to thank everybody for coming. I appreciate you guys and girls showing up. Uh, sorry about all the crazy schedules uh, lately. It's like I'll schedule a show four weeks out. And I have no idea what my schedule is going to be. And then I forget to unschedule it. So that's why you're beginning a random email now and then. Okay. It looks like, uh, looks like we're done. Uh, everybody have a fantastic weekend if we don't talk between now and then. And hopefully I'll see you guys and girls soon. Just keep an eye out for an advertisement. A lot of things are developing this week. So I, I have no idea which office I'll be in and whether or not I'll resume shows in the second office. So just stick, stick with me. Hang in there for a little while. And uh, hopefully we'll straighten all this out. Anyway, everybody, again, enjoy your weekend, and I look to see you soon. Thank you so much.